So, uh, dear friends, dear colleagues, uh, first of all, thank you very much to interrupt your, your dinner and your lunch uh, to, uh, to come to here. Uh, and um, let's start immediately by saying that uh, some of you, well, no, in fact, many of you, have been asking me what is this plaster here <laughs> on your forehead. So, uh, who did you fight with? Well, I can assure you it's not because of the Euro crisis and it is not even because of the Belgian crisis. Even if in Belgium, I think we could use a lot of masters at the moment. It was a stupid accident, actually. I thought it was an open door, but in fact, it was a closed window. <laughs> in, in fact, it, uh, it, it is a little bit like the Euro crisis now, you know? Uh, like we are handling the Euro crisis for the moment. Also, in the Euro crisis today, uh, our heads of uh, states and government every time are hitting their heads against the wall. But a very hard brick wall. And that already for 24 months, taking, in my opinion, and that's my message of today, half measures that are not working, and making the crisis uh, worse and worse. Today, we have new records. 7.28 is the interest rate for Italy. And things are going worse in every member states of the Eurozone. But I come back to this uh, later. So, dear friends, I know, and, and let, us, uh, let us face the reality, there is a lot of Euroscepticism for the moment in Europe. And maybe even in this room. Criticism towards the European budget, criticism towards uh, our resources for Europe, criticism towards a more integrated Europe. And moreover, let's be honest about it also, some of our own political parties are even tempted to follow growing nationalism and growing populism and also growing Euro-scepticism. Well, I believe, I'm very frank to you, that liberalism is exactly the opposite, the antithesis of nationalism and populism. And uh, what is also important, and I think it shall be in this little book that uh, has been presented, there is, ne there is a simple, fundamental rule of politics that you should never ignore. And I knew it because I did uh, a few things in my life, in my political life, against this fundamental rule. People, the citizens, never vote for the copy. Always for the original. So don't try and out-skeptic the skeptics. You never win elections that way. But I hope it's also in the book, but I think that Anami has put it in the book. So, we are not in a crisis of the single currency today, despite the fact that we are paying in Italy now 7.28% on interest rates, and I think uh, Theodor in, uh, in Greece today is 25% of something. 36. Uh, 36, thank you, so, sorry. We are in fact in the crisis of the European Union itself, and I think if we are very serious to ourselves, we have even a crisis of the European project. And yes, that is due to Greece, yes, that is due to the bad finances in several of our countries, and yes, that is the consequence of bad leadership from both, from the Conservatives mainly, and from the Socialists today in many European countries. But let's be blunt about it. It's mainly due to, and it's essentially due to, to the fact that we launched 12 years ago a monetary union, but we did not install an economic, a fiscal, and a political union that we desperately need. And I say it also very clear, a single currency with 17 different governments, 17 different bond markets, 17 different economic strategies, well, it can simply not work. It does not exist anywhere in the world. A single currency needs a single political authority. And maybe, let me tell you that, a state can exist 
without a currency, but a currency cannot exist without a state. A liberal state, actually. That's very good. So, the fact is, and the question is, what is now the way out of this crisis? A crisis will becoming worse and worse every minute, every hour, every day, every week. And I don't say every month, because maybe we have not months before us to recover and to find a solution. Well, the Alliance of Liberal and Democrats in the European Parliament has made it clear from the beginning that we do not believe in less Europe to solve this crisis, but in more Europe. Europe is today not the problem. Europe is the solution to the problem today. And in fact, the choice that we have to make it is very clear. Either we are capable in the next weeks and the next months to establish a, what I call a real federal union, or the euro shall simply disappear. And I think that the loss of the euro will be a tragedy, a disaster, a disaster for everyone, a disaster for the south of Europe, a disaster for the core of Europe, and also, I think, firmly, a disaster for the biggest country of the European Union, for Germany, because it's their engine of their economic growth, it's the drive of their successful export, it's the source of their surplus on their trade balance, and in short, is the reason of their success today, the euro. And not only, not only, dear friends, for Germany, the euro has protected us all against the fallout of the financial crisis in 2008. Remember what happened in Iceland. Remember what happened in, uh, in Hungary. Even in Denmark, they were in big trouble, and I think that without the euro, it would have been a mess everywhere in all the other countries too, with devaluations and depreciations. But let me tell you also that maybe the country that has the most to lose from the disappearance of the euro is the UK, the city of London, the financial heart of Europe today. Because that's not Frankfurt, eh? the financial heart of Europe, that is the ECB, the European Central Bank. No, that's London. They trade more in euros than any other city in the world. So the key question today is that we have to respond as liberal and democrats how to rescue the euro, how to save the European project. And I think uh, it shall not be rescued by um, every two weeks having a meeting of Mercosur, yeah. of Merkel and Sarkozy coming together, calming the markets for only 20 hours, huh? because afterwards it starts again, even worse than before the meeting. So whether you like it or not, I think that the only way to come out of this crisis is to establish the fastest as possible a fiscal, economic and political union, and I call it, and Andrew calls it already a long time, a federal union. And yes, why have to be fear of the word? I know it is not in the Jacobian tradition of the French, and it's true, certainly it's not the reason also for our successes between brackets in Belgium. But uh, let's face the reality. The most powerful country in the world today is a federal state for nearly more than 200 years. United States of America. And the most powerful state in the European Union today, since the Second World War, is Germany. They call the Federal Republic of Germany. So, whether we call it federal or not, let's be face it. We can only save the euro if we establish two things real discipline in the Union, and at the same time, real solidarity. And I'm talking about both of them. Discipline and solidarity, and solidarity and discipline. And why? Because discipline without solidarity is not a real Union. And solidarity without discipline is simply a bottomless pit. That's very clear. So I think that without solidarity and without discipline, the monetary Union is not sustainable. And when I hear today that Mrs. Merkel wants to change the treaty and to root discipline in the treaty, in Article 136 of the treaty, I can only applaud. And I think also Andrew Duff, I think he likes treaty change all the time. 
But I'm also saying, I'm also saying, if we change Article 136 of the treaty, we need also to change Article 125 of the treaty to anchor solidarity in the treaty. And nevertheless, I do not like to criticize Germany all the time that we are now, because that is what everybody says under a German diktat. Discipline is not a German diktat. It is, dear friends, a liberal diktat today. That is the same. As, as at the same time, as at the same time, solidarity is also a liberal diktat. They are the two sides of the same coin. They reinforce each other. And the fact that we defend both of them, discipline and solidarity, makes us unique. Conservatives speak only of discipline, and socialists, as we know, throw money at so-called solidarity. We are the only force to keep the balance between both of them. And that is the reason, that is the reason why our group, the ALDE group, is very outspoken on the way out of the crisis. Let's be honest between us. We also have our differences in our group. Uh, not to speak about Eurobonds, for example, as a good example of these differences. But we are firmly united behind the idea that we need solutions for the short and for the long term. You can solve this only on the long term without having a solution on the short term. And you can solve it only on the short term if you don't have a vision for the long term. So on the short term, we believe that the creation of this European Collective Redemption Fund, the idea of the five wise economists of Germany, why, with uh, mutualizing the debt of the Euro countries above 60% mark, combined with bold reduction schemes, debt reduction schemes, could be a solution for this crisis. Alexander Lambsdorff, a deputy leader, has defended in the world. The Commission has proposed it in his green paper. And for the same reason, our liberal group in the Parliament also defends uh, the idea of my good friend Mark Rutte to increase the power of the European Commission, so that it is not the member states that give the green light before we can impose discipline, because that doesn't work. Look, I was for nine years member of the European Council, and I have never seen once a colleague standing up, pointing the finger to another, and complaining that the other did not follow the rules. That simply is not done among peers, and that has never been the case in the European Council. And that's another big difference between us and the other political families. We are the only force that really believe that only a communitarian, supranational approach can work. Intergovernmentalism cannot work in Europe. And the reason is very simple. The markets, the financial markets, do not believe in that system. Certainly not since 2004, when uh, France and Germany breached themselves the stability pact at that moment. And this communitarian belief, the fact that you need in Europe a supranational authority to have this currency, to have this euro is also the reason why we defend the European budget. Let's stop the fight on this. It's a budget of 1% of the European GDP. It's not the 23% of the United States. This elephant here, that's not the European budget, that's the American budget, what you're seeing. It's also the sign of the Republican Party, as you know, in the United States. If you want to see the European budget, we have to put a mouse on that ball there. A little mouse of 1%. That's the reality of the day. But let's be clear also about this. It's not the moment and the time to make a big increase, because let's be realistic. The bad public finance in every country, we have to stick to that figure. That's nonsense to think that today you can increase it and you can make from the mouse a big elephant. That's not the moment to do it. But we liberals, we think that we can make a better use of this mouse, uh, of this budget. <laughs> so, use it to make 
to to make that uh, that the elephant is afraid of uh, of of, uh, of this, and used it to make all our finance in Europe and in the in the member states more healthy. And let me give you one example, one example of all positions, not the liberal group, not to increase the budget, but to make a better use of this budget. Let me give you one example. Do you know what is the expenditure on defense in Europe? Only on defense. Military expenditures in Europe. It's nearly half the size of the American defense budget. And I can tell you, the American defense budget, that's a huge budget. That's $700 billion today. That's 5% of the American gross domestic product. And you know what the output is of all these expenditures in Europe? Only 10% of the American. With nearly half of the American budget, we are only capable to do only 10% of their operations. So, concretely, we are five times less effective than the Americans. And that should be not a surprise, dear friends. In Europe, we have 27 strategic transport capabilities, 27 intelligence services. 27 maintenance units for the Navy, 27 maintenance units for the Air Force. And I think it's very clear by combining our efforts on the European level in military expenditures, we can nearly save the whole European budget today, if we are very reasonable. And I have to tell you, and maybe I'm going against uh, the majority here in, in, in the room, but okay, that, that can happen. That's democracy. Why not? The same counts about their uh, own resources. I have to tell you one thing. I'm very open about this. And it's not depending about the Alliance for Liberal and Democrats, but the European Parliament has to approve the new multi-annual financial framework at the end of 2012. So the, the leaders of the countries can decide what they want, but the European Parliament shall have to say yes or no to it. And I can tell you, if there are no own resources in it, there shall never be a majority in the European Parliament to do it. And what, what, wait, wait there, Andrew, before you... Uh, <laughs> wait. wait, I was making my point, you know, man. And you know why? Because the European Parliament, please, wants to become a real Parliament. That you all representing in your own parliament. Shouldn't you accept in your parliament that your parliament has no say in the resources of your country? You should say that there's no real democracy. A real democracy is only when the representatives elected by the people can decide on the resources. Well, if you want to have a real parliament on the European level, if you want to have people who are interesting, and interested in European politics. Well, it's very clear. Only when you pay for something, you're interested in something. That's a liberal rule. That's a basic value that we know. And so that's the reason, the only reason. Because as liberals, we are against additional taxation. And we shall vote as liberals against additional taxation on the national and on the European level. But we shall ask for one thing. That is, that there is a direct link between citizens and European democracy, because only then the European democracy can work. Democracy has been invented centuries ago, not by enlightened persons who, who suddenly have found that democracy was necessary. No, democracy has been invented because uh, the king went to the people, to the representatives of the people, and asked it for resources to go to war and to create wealth in their own country. We have to do that also on the European level, because as I said already, Europe is the solution, dear friends. Europe is not the problem today. And the baddest thing that we can do today, the baddest thing that we can do as liberal and democrats in the middle of this Euro crisis is uh, fear, to have fear for our opinions, because fear is a bad the baddest counselor that you can have. My prediction is very simple. My prediction is that not the nationalists and not the populists, 
but that we, the pro-European force, will win the election of 2014, despite what everything is predicting. Because with the crisis, people shall see that more Europe is needed. More Europe is needed to safeguard their income, to safeguard their wealth, and to safeguard their prosperity and their jobs. People are not stupid, dear colleagues. People know that the world is more and more dominated by countries like China and India. And people realize that only a united Europe can guarantee their prosperity in such a world, and that only a united Europe can defend their interests, their income, and their jobs. That is the reality of the world. Let me put it, let maybe put it in another way. Let me put it in another way. Let's not be naive. The G8 in the world of 2035, within 20 years, shall be composed of the United States, China, India, Japan, Russia, Brazil, and then finally Mexico and Indonesia. No Brits, no Germans, no French, and sorry, Leo Luca, we are in Italy here, but also no Italians in the G8. The only way to be and to stay there and to defend our interests is to be united. United as a single entity. United in the G8, in the IMF, in the UN, in the Security Council, and united in our principles, and united as Europeans in our beliefs. And it's true, it's true, people are afraid today. And it's probably true that this fear is the most important reason for their increased attraction to populism and to nationalism. Populists and nationalists will tell the people that you can keep the world outside their borders. Well, that's a lie, dear colleagues. But it's not a lie, it's not a lie that citizens have fear. So we as liberals have to tell another story, and that's our story. You cannot keep the world outside your borders. But yes, only a strong and united Europe can overcome the problems linked to it and can create the stability and the security that citizens are looking for. That's what we believe in and that's what we stand for. Thank you.